1999 or 2000, I can't remember exactly, a man came into my life that has been a, did you lose something? <laughs> did I just say, did I forget something? <laughs> it came into my life that has been a blessing. Um, we met, and we have a date that we share together. We share, that's actually April 9th, which is today. Um, Joe was on our, he said we became friends and became part of our staff for a couple of years. And then the opportunity came for him to become the pastor of Altoona Full Gospel. How many years was that, Joe? 19, 19 years he was at Altoona Full Gospel, uh, recently had retired, and now he had come back here. And we were able to reunite in some ways. And um, a couple of months ago, I was sitting up here, and I was like, I wonder when April 9th is. I looked at my calendar. <laughs> I went back and said, hey, see that? It's April 9th. I said, that's the day you're preaching here. He says, okay. So I come back up here, and I thought, I wonder when Easter is. Oh, it's April 9th. All right, that's okay. Somebody else can preach on Easter, amen? And so, but, uh, and so it's just a delight today. You're going to be blessed today. This man's a wonderful orator of the Word of God. And so would you welcome my friend Joe Kelly this morning? Come on. Good morning, everyone. I know Jim doesn't need a podium, but I can't move quite as quickly as he. We came to Altoona in 1996, and we pastored a church here in Altoona for about three and a half years and kind of bombed out. And it didn't work out too well, and I remember my wife and I weren't sure where to go with our family. And so someone said, why don't you try a spirit-filled church? What was that? And so we came over here, and immediately uh, we were just loved and embraced and made to feel <laughs> special. And we just hung around, and it took about a month or so, maybe not much longer. And your pastor said to me, Joe, would you like to go over to the Father's house and kind of work over there and head things up. <clears throat> An administrator, I am not. And he knew that. But he said, go head over there and, and work. And Randy and Patty were there. They, they were the really nuts and bolts of the whole thing. <clears throat> and so we had a great time. And about five or six months went into our stay <clears throat> with all of you. And I really wanted to preach. And I hadn't preached in five or six months. And so uh, one night Donna went to, uh, where was that Donna? Simpson Temple. She has to do this a lot now. <laughs> and uh, to do a rehearsal with their choir that we were attempting to do all these things. It says stay busy. <clears throat> and I was home alone. Uh, my boys were out and uh, or girls, I don't think they were, they were quite young. And, and uh, so I went into the bedroom and I remember the Lord said, close the door and meet with your heavenly father. So I just kind of poured everything out to him and talked to him a little bit. And, and uh, I picked up an NIV Bible and turned to Psalm 86 and verse 10. And this is what it said. Let not the morning depart without a token of your unfailing love. And so immediately it was a rhema, and I simply said, God, before tomorrow morning ends, please bless me and give me an opportunity to preach. And so I woke up the next, I, I was so excited about it, I was jumping on the bed. I didn't, I jumped a little better than I jumped three weeks ago. I've been in oxygen therapy ever since, Pastor Jim. And I jumped all over the bed, and the next morning I just knew that God was going to do something because he had given me his word. And so this was 1999, and we didn't have cell phones then. We still had phones hanging on the wall. And so I woke up that morning, and at 9 o'clock the phone rang. I said, this is it. Something's going to happen. It was a telemarketer. <laughs> 10 o'clock, the same thing happened, a telemarketer. 11 o'clock, and the same thing happened. Same results. 
And I remember very vividly saying, Lord, if I've been presumptuous, if I've stepped out of bounds, Lord, please forgive me. And I just sort of kind of put it away. And about 20 after 11, the phone rang, Pastor Jim. Joe, what are you doing? Uh, not much, because I really wasn't doing much that day. He said, well, I'm over at Haas's. Why don't you come on over? I'll treat you to lunch. So I went, and we went and got into the salad line. You know how that all works. And then Jim starts talking about all that he wants to do. <clears throat> That's not changed. <laughs> and then, Joe, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And then, I, then we're going to do this. And in my spirit, I was saying, oh, yeah, yeah. That's just wonderful. And this went on for about five or seven minutes. He just kept on talking about his plans and, and, and all for the glory of God. Am I right? Ah, God finds a man like that. He's surely going to use him. And so he went on and finally... We were eating our salad, and he dropped his fork, and he looked me dead in the eye. And he said, by the way, Joe, I want you to preach for me in two weeks, April 9th. And I looked at my watch, and it said five minutes to 12. <laughs> Never forget that moment. That's how good that the Lord is. And so... As he just said, we came back here after our retirement, <clears throat> night and day, <laughs> that's all I can say. And when we got here, he said to me, Joe, I want you to preach for me on April the 9th. I said, Jim, that's Resurrection Sunday. I know, Joe, I want you to preach for me on April the 9th. So here I am, and I trust that the Lord will encourage us. Thank you. You know, there are 330 messianic prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ that are so patently obvious in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New Testament. And all of them are leading up to this one focal point in history. That is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the focal point. And that is why we're here today. You know, I once knew a pastor when I was uh, a young Christian, and uh, that was a long time ago. And he prided himself on speaking and preaching differently than anyone else. And uh, I still remember that he was preaching through the book of 1 Corinthians. And... Uh, verse by verse. And so when Resurrection Sunday came, he just ignored the resurrection. And I still remember the title of his message on that Resurrection Sunday. Here's what it was. It was, Why Women Should Wear a Head Covering in Church. <laughs> that was his message. And uh, <clears throat> men... And the rest of us, women, take a look around at the women in the church today. Their hair is their covering. And if I'm wrong about that, one day I may have to be corrected. But if I'm wrong about him being a substitution for my sins, if I'm wrong about him taking all of his righteousness and implanting it to you and me? If I'm wrong about that, then I've lost the two greatest keys in all the universe. And I am locked out of the greatest place in all of the universe. That place is called, you know it well. You know it well. So this morning I'd like us to see three places that are absolutely paramount for us to look at. I'm trying to see the back there, so maybe I can just see the front, if I can, or behind me. I want us to see, first of all, that these three places 
Number one, the cross. Oh, I got a couple verses there. All we like sheep have gone astray. Come on, read it with me. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The iniquity of us all. Here's another one that you don't want to forget. For he, who's the he? Well, that's God the Father. For he made him, who's the him? That's God the Son, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That means he took all of the wicked things I've ever done in my life, more than the very hairs of my head. He took them off of me, and he put it on himself. That means he took all of the wicked thoughts I've had all of my life. He took all of them out of me, and he put them on himself. That means that he took all of the words of debauchery in my whole life. He took them off of me, and he put them all on himself. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Can somebody say amen? amen. That's what he did for us. And so now these three places. First of all, you got to start at the cross. Would you say it with me? It is finished. And then, of course, there's the empty tomb. He is risen. And then the third one is the shore of Galilee, where he said, feed my lambs. Three places. So let's begin if we can. Uh, you know, Matthew records this for us in Matthew 27, 43 and 44. He trusted in God. Now, this is the Pharisees, by the way, speaking under the cross. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him. Now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. We have to see this thief on the cross. And the next verse, if we can, Luke 23 and verse 32. There are also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. They were the two thieves beside Jesus. Jesus in the middle, of course. And all of a sudden, as only the Holy Ghost did to the 30 or 40 or 50 people who came up here and blessed our socks off without saying a word, who can, who can make that kind of a scene but the Spirit of God? And Pastor Jim said that Wednesday night. People looked at each other. He said, now write down what you were and what you are now. And I didn't know how that would be uh, uh, demonstrated before us. Never a word. They just came, put up the flapping cards, and simply said, here's who I was. Here who I am now. This is what he did for me. Did anything touch you better than that? I mean, could you ever see such a thing like that? The Holy Spirit knows how to orchestrate a service, doesn't he? And so the one of the criminals at that moment that the Holy Spirit, you know the Holy Spirit will speak to everybody at one time or another. It's up to us what we do with it. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself in us. But the other, ah, who previously was doing the same thing, by the way, answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And then he says these words we know so well. For we indeed, indeed justly, for we have received the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Read it with me. Assuredly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Today. Now, there's a group of people today, uh, uh, I think they're believers, but they have this idea 
that unless we make restitution for all of the wrongdoings that we have done in our lifetime, unless we're able to go and make amends for all of those iniquities, that that sin is not forgiven. So I want you to think closely. When he said that to Jesus, Lord, would you remember me when you enter into your kingdom? Now, suppose Jesus had said, well, you know, I'd like to, but man, you've got a lot of baggage. I mean, man, you've ripped, you've ripped a lot of people off. Now, you've got to go back and you've really got to make things right before I can take you into my kingdom. He had about 45 minutes to live, this dying thief. Good luck. You know, I think these people get that theology from this verse. And Jesus said, when you go to the altar to bring your offering before the altar and you remember that your brother has ought against you, first go to your brother, be reconciled with your brother, and then come back to the altar and lay your gift on the altar. Jesus said that. Well, that's how to get right with people. That's not how you get saved. That is not how you get saved. Can I flesh this out just for a minute or two more in this first point about this dying thief? You remember Saul of Tarsus, don't you? Before he became the Apostle Paul. Did you know what he did in Acts chapter 9? He went to homes, drug out men and women, separating them from their children, threw them in prison. And then you know what he did. He was the orchestrator of the stoning the death of Stephen. They put their coats. He had gathered the stones. He had moved everything into position. And Stephen was stoned to death. And then God knocked him off his high horse. Yeah, that's what he does. He comes along and he knocks us off our high horse. And he became not Saul of Tarsus any longer, but he became the Apostle Paul. And you know, the interesting thing is he gave us more than half of our New Testament. You know that. Just about all of our epistles. But I never read one verse where he told us how we go back and make restitution. In fact, I don't read, Pastor Jim, that he went back and knocked on all the doors of the people he had thrown into prison. I don't read any verse like that. Now, let's just flesh this even a little more. How many have heard of King Manasseh? Would you lift up your hand? Oh, this might be Sunday school today. He was the most wicked king who ever presided over Judah. Now, his father was a godly man. His name was Hezekiah. But he was so wicked, this man, this king, that uh, the things that he did, the first thing he did as he took in the courtyard of God, he put all of the idols of Baal, put them in the courtyard. And if that wasn't enough, he actually put the idols of Baal inside the temple where your heavenly father said his name would dwell forever. He put idols in the temple. And if that wasn't enough, this is what we read about him in 2 Chronicles 33 and verse 6. Also, he caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. That means he literally, are you ready for this? Sacrificed his sons to idols. That's what he did, King Manasseh. He practiced smooth saying. He used witchcraft, sorcery, consulted mediums, spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. This is what he did. And 2 Chronicles tells us that God spoke to him over and over again and to the people, spoke to them and pointed out, stop this behavior, if I can put that in the vernacular. And they would not listen, so God put a hook in his nose. God ever put a hook in your nose? So he brings you to a place where you've got no choice but to see God is ready to work in your life. 
put a hook in his nose and drug him off to Babylon. The Assyrians were captivating Babylon at that time. You know what he did? He got on his knees and on his knees, probably his face and cried out, oh God, forgive me. You know what 2 Chronicles 33, 6 says? And the Lord was entreated by him. You've got a God who will forgive anything if we repent. You know, the amazing thing is, Jesus said all manner of sin and blasphemy against the Son of Man shall be forgiven. What a God you serve. What a God I serve. And you know what God did? He picked this man up and he brought him back to Jerusalem. And the first thing he did, he repaired all the walls. He got rid of all of the idols in the courtyard, in the temple, strengthened the work of God. And that is what he did. And so, one more. You certainly know of Zacchaeus, don't you? And you remember in Luke chapter 19, here is Zacchaeus on a sycamore tree. He was by profession, anyone? A tax collector. Thank you, Pastor Jim. That's good. He was a tax collector. They were notorious for ripping people off. No comments on modern tax collectors. They're, we're not suggesting anything like that, lest somebody here collect taxes for a living. And uh, he was up that sycamore tree, and Jesus came through Jericho that day. He looked up at the sycamore tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, come down for today. I must dine at your house. And that's what he said. And do you know he got out of that tree and he came down and this is what he said, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor. And Lord, if I've ripped anybody off, I'll give a fourth of all that I have to them. You know, Pastor Jim's a good teacher. Wednesday night he did a tremendous job on Galatians chapter 3 a few Sundays ago. Everybody say this with me. Whoa, before I fall down. <clears throat> Everybody say this with me. I am not under the law. You have nothing to do with the Mosaic law. That is finished. Thank God for men of God who will stand and, and say that and keep someone from tripping, I hope. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> Jesus said, today, salvation has come to your house. Do you know what people say? Well, you see, there's the proof. He had to be willing to make restitution before he could find salvation. Now, listen close. You get nothing else. Get this. When he said that, I give half my goods to the poor and a fourth of all I had, the people I miffed ripped off. When he said those things, that was prescriptive. What I'm trying to say is, the real essence is, that's not how you get saved. It was not a prescription. What he did do was make a statement that did not describe his description, but rather described what he was feeling. That's exactly prescriptive versus descriptive. He was so excited that he ran down and said, I'll give anything to know Jesus, just like the people who got up here Last week, I understand, ran to the tub and wanted to jump in, or may did, with their clothes on. Not because they wanted to get saved, but because they were saved. There's no prescription. It was a description. Isn't God good? It is 
finished. Secondly, let's look at Mary Magdalene. The tomb, he is risen. You know what John said in chapter 20 and verse 1? Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, the interesting thing is you'll notice that Mary got up while it was still dark. You know what? You get seven demonic spirits cast out of you by Jesus, you're not going to be afraid of the dark. No, no, no. You know what she did? She got up and got dressed, not afraid to walk through the streets that were darkened in Jerusalem, not afraid not to have an escort with her, not afraid to walk into a dark cemetery because she had already been translated, or as Pastor Jim said, conveyed out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. I mean, there was no more darkness that she feared. And so she arrived at the tomb, and she saw that the stone had been moved, and she went in and saw the tomb empty, and we'll get back to this in a little bit. But the first thing she did, she went and she found John and she found Peter. And she told them that the tomb was empty. Now, you know, I'm just betting that the people in this house love their pastor so much that whatever's going on in their life, they want him to know about it. Am I right? You want him to know. Otherwise, you wouldn't be parading up here with all of those signs. And so she goes and she finds them, and they come to the tomb. Do you remember reading that John outran Peter? <clears throat> well, John was younger than Peter, but I think there was another reason, which we'll get to in a minute. Most of you already know what it was. And so they come to the tomb, and the tomb is rolled away. I'm sorry, the stone is rolled away. They come in, and this is what they see. They see two angels on each side where the head of Jesus was and also the feet. And in the center was the burial cloth, which was folded up. Immediately, and I never put this together before until Pastor Jim said it just last Wednesday night, that is a carbon, ladies and gentlemen, that is a carbon of the Day of Atonement. When the brazen altar, which consisted of two cherubim on either end, and in the middle, the mercy seat, where the blood of the sacrifice was right there in the center. And that's exactly what God demonstrated. And you know what they did? John says, John was writing his own gospel. He said, and then the disciples went home. They went home. They went to their houses. Well, not Mary. You get saved from seven devils, you're going to be loyal. Mary lingered by the tomb. You know, it pays to linger and wait for the Lord. Because if you wait on the Lord, you shall rise up with ink wings like eagles. And she waited. It's a good thing to wait on the Lord. But then what happened was that Jesus actually came and John says, and she, supposing it was the gardener. Remember, mm, supposing it was the gardener. Do you know we get in an awful lot of trouble when we suppose things? We spend a lifetime of fear, a lifetime of anxiety, supposing this and supposing that. Maybe today the Spirit of the living God will speak to you and me and we will stop supposing. Don't worry what others think of you. Don't worry about 
others may say about you, because they're going to think it and say it anyway. Supposing it was the gardener, we'd be a whole lot better off if we did not suppose so much in our lives. Maybe some of you are familiar with this in an acronym for fear, F-E-A-R. Thank you. Who said that? False evidence appearing real. That's what supposing is. Don't carry it. Let it go. And so, Mary, faithful to the end, he said, Mary, and she knew immediately it was Jesus. Can you hear his voice? Surely you can. And so there's the dying faith over the cross. It is finished, was finished, is finished, will always be finished. And there's the empty tomb. He is not here. He is risen. And finally, let's go to the third and final thought, John 20, verse 11 and 12. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. Okay, I guess I'm just catching up here, so catch up with me. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down, looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white seating, sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. <clears throat> I should tell Mary we just taught that. That third point. Why do pastors always use points? Don't know, but I can't break that at this stage. It's Peter. The shore of Galilee. Feed my sheep. You know what happened? You know, Peter had failed miserably. I mean to say, he failed big time. He denied the Lord three times in that courtyard. Did you know Mark's gospel actually says he swore with an oath that he didn't know him? He really messed up. He messed up bad. And so after the resurrection and he did his due diligence, he met in the upper room, but something was a bit different in Peter. And Jesus had actually prophesied that to him before his crucifixion. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. And when you are converted, Feed my sheep. That's what he told him. Peter forgot all about that. And so you know in that courtyard, he swore with an oath. I tell you, I don't know him. Whew. And so now he said to the other disciples, I'm going fishing. I think rightly translated in our minds, I'm done with this. I'm done. I'm going back to fishing. This thing didn't work for me. You know, it, yeah, I, 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 I'm just done. That's what a guilty conscience can do. So they went fishing, and you know the story. They see this figure on the shoreline, and someone says, it's the Lord. And so they all, they all end up going, and they greet Jesus, and Jesus decides to do this. He brings Peter right back to the place where he had denied him by three things. First of all, he's got a coal of fire going. It's exactly what happened in the courtyard. He warmed himself, Peter did, with the coal of fire. The second thing he did, he addresses Peter not with the name he had given him, thou art Peter, and upon this rock. No, he calls him Simon Barjona. That was his unsaved name. Every one of you know you've got a new name written in heaven for you, already a new name. And so Jesus goes back to his old name, and finally he does this. He reminds him of his denials, three denials. So this is what Jesus said. Peter, do you love me more than these, meaning the fish, he said, yes, Lord, you know, you know that I love you. He said, feed my lambs. You know the word that Jesus used, agape? Do you love me with all of your heart? 
I mean, are you willing to die for me? That's conjecture, but are you willing to go all the way for me? <laughs> are you willing? He could not use that Greek word. He used the word phileo, which simply means, I'm fond of you, Lord. But when you deny him three times, you might not be quite as rambunctious. We might not have the same step with our signs if we had just done that. Jesus asked him a second time, do you love me more than these? Lord, you know I love you. Same words. The third time, Simon, do you love me more than these? He still could not say. He said, yes, Lord. I think Jesus must have said in his own spirit, that's good enough. That's good enough. From now on, feed my sheep. You know, the interesting thing is Peter was full of fear, as we often are, for every reason under the sun. And yet, reliable church history tells us that Peter, when it came time to being crucified by Rome, asked to be crucified upside down so that he wouldn't be crucified as his Savior. Resurrection Sunday. Oh, my, what a day. You know, I'm so grateful to have been here this morning because I would not have missed that parade. Never a word spoken, and yet our hearts were just bubbling over. It's like we were just going to burst. Some of the expressions on their faces, some of them dressed to remind us what God had done for them and brought them from. There they were. That's you, that's me. What a wonderful Savior we had. Thank God for Resurrection Sunday. It sure beats worrying <laughs> about that. Jim, we got to fix this. I know I can't last too many years long, but we've got to do something about this. I've got to hold on here. It sure beats preaching on a woman's head covering. Jim, would you close this thing out? <laughs> I thought I was going to have to tag in there for a moment. <laughs> Listen to me. You're here today. You've seen the evidence of his goodness. You saw the evidence of his goodness walking across this platform showing you what they were, and showing you what they are now. You saw the power of God that works in a person's life when they yield their life to the God. You saw what people were. You saw what they are. You heard from Joe about the finished work of the cross. You heard about the, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection. You see in the scripture the changed lives of a Mary Magdalene, seven demons cast out of her. You see the restoration of a risen Savior. If, if Jesus doesn't raise himself or get raised from the dead by God, Peter is never restored. He never lives out the destiny for which God created him. The power of the resurrection is amazing. And the Bible promises us that his spirit lives inside of us. That same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. Here's the deal this morning. Some of you walked in here you know what you were. You know what you are. You know what some of you used to be. But some of you this morning say, you know what? I want that testimony. I want that testimony of I was, but now I am. I was, but now I am. You, you see, and there's only one way that happens. You can't make it happen. You can't pay for it. You can't make enough restitution for it. There's nothing you can do in your own will, in your own striving, in your own um, self-determination, nothing. There's only the life-changing power of Jesus Christ, that His Spirit that lives inside of you. And the only way that you can go from being an I was to an I am is by being born again. That's what the Bible says very clearly, that we would give our heart, that we, that, that we would come to a place that we would say, I believe, I confess that Jesus Christ 
is Lord. He's master. He's Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Then the Bible says you're born again. And from the moment you become born again, you have a new identity. You have a new name. And you begin that process by where the Holy Spirit does a work inside of you that you can one day say, I was that, but now I'm this. I was, but now I am. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We would be remiss to spend Resurrection Sunday and not give an opportunity for you to be born again, for you to become someone who can say, I was, but now I am. I was, but now I am. I was lost. I was bound. I was this but my God set me free, but God has done a work in my life. But you start with you saying, I am gonna give him my heart. I'm gonna accept him as Lord and Savior. I wanna be born again. If that's you today, you're here, raise your hand nice and high. Somebody's gonna come and pray with you. Today you say, I wanna be born anew. I wanna be, I wanna be a new creation. I wanna be a new creature. I wanna be new by the blood of Jesus Christ. We got one right back there. Uh, we have people going to pray with you. They're ready to step out. The moment you raise your hand, put it up nice and high. Nice and high. Don't be ashamed. Right here. We have a gentleman right here. There's people coming to pray with you. There's another, a young man right there. Somebody go to that young boy right there. That little guy there, man. There's a, there's a man of God right there. And we have that gentleman right there in front of you, Donnie. Okay. Anybody else want to join these ones? I don't, you know me. I don't take, I don't do this real long. You know the Spirit of God's already been working on you. The Spirit of God worked on you when these people were coming across the stage. You were saying, how do I get that? How do I become changed like that? And the only way you do it is in this moment you say, God, come into my life. Here's my heart. I surrender everything. One more time. Anybody else want to? Right there. There's a lady right there. We need a lady back here, Patty. Anybody else? Count to three. If I miss somebody, somebody point them out. One, one, two, three. Let me say one more thing before we give it to Pastor Troy. There's a there's a movie called The Day After Tomorrow like an apocalyptic movie and something happens and there's the, the, the devastation of the day after tomorrow, right? Don't let next week be the Sunday after Resurrection Sunday. What am I saying? I'm saying sometimes people come to church once or twice a year. It's coming in Easter, coming, coming, uh, coming on Christmas. Don't do that. Come on, man. Come back next week. Come back the week after that. Why? Why? To get saved? No, you're already saved. You're coming to celebrate with the saints. You're coming to worship God. This is something where iron sharpens iron. This is something where the Spirit of God works in you. This is something where we come and the Spirit of God moves in an atmosphere where, you, where He ministers to the body as, as a whole. You don't want to miss that. Father, right now, across this room, people are being prayed for. People have made a decision. They're say, simply saying, I don't want to be what I once was. I don't want to be that anymore. I want to be new. I want to be new. I want to be different. I want you to change me from the inside out. I don't want you to just... I don't, I don't want to have just a behavior modification. I want to have an internal transformation. And Father, this day... Men and women and young people are praying right now. And they're coming to you. So, Father, we seal it by the Spirit of God. That they are a new creation in Christ Jesus. From this moment forward, they're able to walk out of here saying, I was, but now I am. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was uh, outside of God's grace, but now I'm a child of God. And, Father, for that we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Troy.